weekend so far. Uh, the weather has not been too bad around here, but I think it has been in some places. This is a very good lesson that we're going to have today. It's a continuation of the uh, lesson on the resurrection. And the focus is that the resurrection of Christ changes everything. It's going to be taken out of 1 Corinthians 15 again. And um, I'm going to be reading out of both the King James Version from our Sunday School book and also some from the New Living Translation that I think will make some of these verses a little bit clearer. I want to um, start with prayer today, and I want us to remember all those that have been affected not only by the coronavirus, but also by the storms and the weather that um, some parts of our nation have been having that have been devastating to some. And uh, remember, if you're in a place where you haven't, you don't know of anyone that's had the coronavirus or you haven't had um, any experience with that yet other than just having to be careful and follow government uh, rules about how to uh, keep safe and keep others safe. And if you're not any of the storm hit areas, um, it always can be us. Um, we don't need to think that we're exempt just because we haven't experienced those things yet. Maybe you've experienced a lot of other um, tragedies. Maybe you're going through something right now that uh, you're really struggling with. So I'm going to start with prayer, and I'm going to pray for you and for all these things that are going on in our nation and around the world, and then we'll begin the lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for the joy that you give and the sunshine that you bring, even uh, when it seems like that the weather is bad. We have the sunshine and joy of Jesus in our hearts, Father. And Lord, for those who don't have that, I pray that they will before today is over. Lord, I pray for all of those who are dealing with um, storm or uh, weather losses and um, tragedies, Lord, with those that are struggling because of uh, lack of income or jobs, and with those who have health problems, not only the coronavirus, but other health problems. And for those, Lord, who have lost loved ones, I pray for those who are grieving. I pray, Father, for our missionaries around the world and for Christians who are being persecuted. And I pray for our government leaders, um, not only ours in the United States, but around the world at this critical time, Lord, when there's so much unknown and so much uh, focus has to be uh, on this, this new uh, disease that we haven't dealt with before and how to handle it and how to um, handle the economy and everything else that's involved with it. But I pray, Father, for us as Christians that you'll help us keep our trust in you, our focus on you, and know that you care for us and that you will take care of us, but we need to put our faith in you. And Lord, for those who are not saved, I pray that they'll put their faith in you to be saved today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Last week, I said, um, I think probably in closing, that without the cross of Christ, there's no, there would be no resurrection. Without the resurrection, there would be no eternal life. Without belief in Jesus Christ, there's no salvation. Neither the cross, nor the blood, nor resurrection will matter if you don't believe. So I pray today that if you don't believe that you will, if you do, that you'll be encouraged and uh, strengthened by this lesson. It's going to be out of 1 Corinthians 15. The first verses are 20 through 22, but I'm going to read verse 19 first that leads into this, and I'm going to read that out of the New Living Translation. If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. And I think Paul said this in um, King James, we are of most men, all men most miserable. So if the only thing we have look for, to look forward to as Christians is what's going to happen in this life, um, we're just fighting a losing cause. 
But that's not all we have to look forward to. We have eternal life to look forward to. So let's read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22. This will be out of the King James Version. And for any who don't have uh, the book, if you have your Bibles, even if you have a different version, if you try to follow along, uh, I think you'll get more out of it. So I'll start reading now. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Uh, first, before I get into this, I want to say two things. One, um, I'm probably going to do this lesson in segments because it's such a good lesson and there's so much in here. I can't do it in the length of time that uh, we've been doing it. And I didn't prepare any music for this uh, lesson today. The second thing I wanted to say in verse 20 in the King James Version, a lot of times this is misread as a question because of the way the words are placed in the sentence. In the old language and in a lot of um, foreign languages, the, the words are not... The uh, verbs and nouns are not placed in the sentence the same way we normally do today. So it starts out and says, but now is Christ risen from the dead. And that simply means now Christ is risen from the dead. The verb and the, the noun are transposed there. So be sure that if you read this chapter, this is something that you're going to see more and more in this chapter if you read it. Be sure that you notice the punctuation because a lot of times there's more than once this is going to be like this and it's a uh, statement not a question. There are some questions in the chapter but be careful. So the first fruits that uh, Paul is talking about is a metaphor based on the Mosaic law that required farmers to bring their first or best crops to the house of the Lord to be dedicated to God. Now God expects the saved to give from the heart and not by the law. This was from the law. And he not only uh, required the first fruits, but he also required a tithe of all that they brought in. So in leading up to this passage, Paul stressed the importance of an actual and historical resurrection. Jesus is the first fruit of the um, ones who will rise from the dead, those who are saved. Now, everybody is going to be in a resurrection at uh, some time in the future. And in Daniel and in John, it specifies that some will be raised um, for good and some uh, not. So I want to be in the good bunch. Uh, in verse 14, he said, if Christ be not risen, and that if, if, if Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. In other words, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, nothing we do as Christians, as churches, pastors, evangelists, missionaries, nothing we do makes any difference. Without the resurrection, there's no salvation, everything would be in vain. So Paul made this statement to respond to some of the Corinthian Christians who did not believe in the resurrection. So even back during the time that the New Testament was written, there were churches and there were Christians uh, already meeting and already established, but already following some false doctrine. That's something we need to be very, very careful about. Please if you're not sure about something, even if it's in the Bible, sometimes um, Bible texts are misinterpreted or are misused. So if it doesn't seem right, if, or if you don't know, find somebody that can help you understand. And, um, and read your Bible. Read your Bible because a lot of times just in reading, one passage will interpret another and you'll understand better. So um, it said that 
to give, um, let me see. He argued that if there is no resurrection, then not even Christ rose from the dead. Paul offered the further conviction that if there were no resurrection, then to proclaim the risen Jesus was to give false testimony about God. It was equivalent to breaking the ninth commandment, which is not to bear false witness or don't lie. So if you're saying that there's not going to be any resurrection, Paul said you may as well be lying because that means if there's not going to be a resurrection, then Christ didn't rise from the dead. So what good is anything that we do? I'm going to go on. Um, Christ's resurrection precedes the harvest of others, which is us. When his followers, which is us, or Christians all through the ages, will be raised from the dead. While physical death is inevitable, Jesus' resurrection demonstrates that our death is not the end of the story. So because of Adam's sin, which is um, what this is referring to partly, because of Adam's sin, all of us are going to die physically, unless Christ comes back and raptures the church first. Then whoever still, whatever Christians are still living at that time will be raptured. But otherwise, we're going to die. Our bodies are not going to hold up forever. But if we believe in Jesus, then uh, we will be raptured. At, uh, we will be resurrected at the last day. In an atheistic view, death is the end of the story. How sad. How sad. Atheists are not the only ones that believe that. There are other people, other, uh, I guess I could say religions, that teach some, something like this. Um, one teaches that good people or people of their religion that follow the laws of their religion are going to um, live in paradise or on earth or in heaven or however they teach it. Uh, but all the people who are not in that category are just going to be, some teach that there will be a judgment and people will be raised and annihilated at that time, the ones who are not considered the good people. So that's, there's no hope. There's no hope in a teaching like that. If, um, if that's all that there is, then why should I um, care about how I live now? Because if I'm just going to die, and maybe I'm going to be raised and, and judged, and then just be annihilated, and that's the end of it, what difference does it make? But the difference it makes is that eternal life for Christians is true, and eternal death and damnation and hellfire, eternal, is true for non-Christians, for those who don't believe. Don't ever think that whatever you're doing will just be forgotten after death, because God is just, and He can't um, He can't allow sin to prevail. So. Adam's sin brought death into the world, but what Christ has done means that death isn't how things have to be. Through Christ, we have a way out of the, this mess of humanity that we made of life and of God's creation. A singular historical event in the cosmos has overturned the effects of our sin and its destructive consequence. Jesus' resurrection has secured new life. Because Christ conquered death and rose again, we, believers, have the assurance of this new life, a sure hope in things yet to come. So, just what I've been talking about, our hope is in Christ and in the resurrection. Uh, without that, we have no hope. Um, the next part, 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 28 has a, a lot of um, the pronouns, he, his, and him. Some of, t some of the time he's talking about uh, Jesus, and this is Paul writing this, but some of the time he's talking about God the Father. And 
I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. If you want to read it out of the King James Version, you can. And I believe you'll see uh, how confusing it can be. So I'm going to read it out of New Living. It clears it up a little bit. And this is verses 23 through 28. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come, when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the scriptures say, God has put all things under his authority, and that's his is Christ. Of course, when it says all things under his authority, that does not include God himself. Who gave Christ his authority. So God will God the Father will never be under the authority of Christ the Son. Then when all things are under his authority, the Son will put himself under God's authority, so that God who gave his Son authority over all things will be utterly supreme over everything everywhere. So uh, Jesus is in authority now because God has given him that authority. When everything is completed, Jesus himself will be under the authority of God, the Father. So, and when it says under his feet, it refers to the complete victory Jesus will ultimately have over all God's enemies. The resurrection of Christ holds two significant truths. It wasn't just anyone who was raised from the dead. It was God incarnate. In Matthew 1.23, it says that Jesus would be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Secondly, Jesus' power over death means he is Lord or ruler of all. Uh, no one, no king, uh, no one in any kind of authority is greater than Christ. We've heard um, some comments made about authority recently and who has it, but Jesus has ultimate authority. During his earthly ministry, Jesus made claims to divinity. Divinity meaning he is God. He forgave people's sins, identified himself as Lord of the Sabbath, knew people's innermost thoughts, and said he was one with the Father. All of Jesus' claims would have been meaningless had he stayed in the grave, wouldn't have meant anything if he hadn't risen from the grave. However, Jesus' resurrection was the ultimate evidence that he is who he claimed to be, God, the promised Messiah, and the Savior of mankind. Only God has power over death, and Jesus demonstrated that power through his resurrection. Jesus is the Savior of mankind, of all mankind, but it's that's determined by those who choose to believe in him, who believe in him and repent of their sins and ask his forgiveness and give their life to him. Jesus needs to be ruler of our life, not just savior to say, okay, I believe now I'm going to heaven. No, he needs to be ruler of our entire life, our life while we live on this earth. He is our master and our Lord. And that means that we must submit our lives to him let him guide us and um, lead us in everything that we do. And everything we do, we should try. And I know um, we're never going to be perfect, but we should try to always live our lives in a way that's pleasing to God and that brings glory to him and that shows Jesus to others. With everything that comes at us in life, this lesson is so applicable today. Diseases. Injuries, heartbreak, financial instability, disasters, and war. What is the worst thing that can happen? Death? Is it? Of all our enemies, death is the worst because it claims finality on our lives and on the lives of those we love. Death is a tyrannical foe because it makes no bargains with us. We cannot go back. There are no second chances after death. It reigns over us, for we are all subject to death through our fallen nature. But Jesus changed that. The last enemy 
that shall be destroyed is death. By defeating death as an enemy, Jesus demonstrated with finality that he is the Lord of all things. Over the course of Jesus' earthly life, the disciples and others saw him command many forces. He commanded the wind and the waves on the sea, on the Sea of Galilee. The demons submitted to him when he exercised them or when he cast them out. He healed multitudes of people of their diseases and infirmities. He even brought people back from the dead, but they died again. They didn't rise to live forever like Jesus did, but they will one day if they believe in him. We see both natural forces and spiritual forces are under the authority of Christ. However, when Jesus physically rose from the dead with a new and incorruptible body, no longer subject to death, he demonstrated that even death had finally submitted to his authority. But what would it mean if no subsequent resurrection awaited us? We would have no more than another mythological tale of a somewhat powerful God or demigod, a tale of one who displayed greatness in some miraculous works, but whose power was limited. In ancient myths, we see similar thinking about a mythological God, but Jesus Christ is neither demigod nor mythological figure. He is the one through whom all creation came to be and is held together. His resurrection is a sign that all things are subject to him, including the authorities and principalities of the world. That means the spiritual world as well as the physical world. Jesus Christ is alive and reigns as Lord over all. Excuse me. So 1 Corinthians 54 through 58, and I'm going to read 54 out of the New Living Translation, and the others I think are pretty well easily explained, uh, self-explainable. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Now go on with verse 55. Through 58. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Christ indeed rose from the dead. The Christian witness in the resurrection of Jesus is the only historically evidenced reversal of death. Since death is the consequence of sin, Romans 6.23 tells us that, then Jesus' defeat of death also demands the defeat of the power of sin. Jesus didn't just change our end game. He changed the way we live our earthly lives here and now. Sin does not have power over those who have trusted in Jesus for new life. This means we no longer have to succumb to the power of sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what we earn from our sin is death. But by believing in Jesus, we have the gift. And it's a free gift of eternal life. Christ's resurrection means we do not live our lives in vain. Everything we do matters in this life. Paul said, your, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Unfortunately, a host of negative influences still seek to pull us away from the goodness of the one who gives life. The first century Corinthian believers also faced this struggle. Therefore, Paul encouraged the Corinthians, as well as all believers, to live for the things that lead to life. Spreading the truth provides freedom to others. This is the work to which the resurrection calls us, and it will never be a work done in vain. The resurrection of Jesus is foundational doctrine and truth that transforms all of life. The question is, how will you live out that truth? 
If you believe in Jesus and you've been saved, you've accepted him as your savior, then are you living out that truth? If not, would you like to know him and allow him to be Lord and Savior, master of your life, and give you a life that he controls when we're completely out of control? I think um, I finished a little sooner than I expected, maybe because I didn't use the music. So we're praying, and I hope you have a blessed day. And if you need to um, talk to someone, or if you want to, you want to understand more, you need to find uh, scriptures that will help you along your struggle, or just something that that you want to read for, to give you joy. Uh, you can contact me or anyone at Beacon Light Baptist Church, especially Pastor Chris Myers or Kathy Myers, his wife. And this is the ladies' Sunday school class. I'm Diana Kinslow. I'm sorry I forgot to state that at the beginning. And it's Beacon Light Baptist Church in St. Charles, Virginia. So I pray and hope that we will all be able to meet in our church buildings and fellowship together very soon. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for Jesus, who died for our sins and rose again on the third day to guarantee us the resurrection for those of us who believe. Father, I pray for the ones who haven't accepted Christ as Savior yet. I pray that they will, that the Holy Spirit will convict them and deal with them and uh, bring them to uh, salvation, Lord. I just pray that you'll guide each of us throughout this week and help us to realize the joy and the hope that we have in Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.